In May 1959, the U.S. Armed Forces Corps of Engineers explored a distant area in Greenland for Camp Century, named because it was initially planned to be constructed a hundred miles from the edge of the Greenland ice top. The engineers chose the site 150 miles from the Thule Air Base in probably the harshest conditions possible. Temperatures as low as negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 56 Celsius. Tornadoes as high as 125 miles an hour and a yearly snowfall of multiple feet. Regardless of these difficulties, in less than two years, the army developed a rambling complex underneath the Arctic ice equipped for lodging 200 fighters. Just some brief history on the site. In 1951, the United States and Denmark, both establishing members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, otherwise known as NATO, marked the Defense of Greenland Agreement. The idea was planned to arrange courses of action under which military of the gatherings towards the NATO may utilize and protect offices in Greenland and the remainder of the North Atlantic Treaty territory. Simply, the understanding permitted the United States to manufacture army installations in Greenland. Throughout the following decade, the American military assembled three air bases in Greenland, Narsiswak, Sonderstrom, and Thule. In the setting of the Cold War, these bases gave a refueling point and supportive activities for moderate-range vital aircraft. Moreover, the United States conveyed radar stations in Greenland to keep up a ballistic missile early warning system and a distance early warning line, which would give the United States guidance ahead of time of a Soviet atomic assault. The Thule Air Force Base is the main of the three which is yet to be operational today. Under a thousand miles from the North Pole, it is the U.S. Flying Corps' northmost base. There was a very simple logical explanation behind the ICE Center not only for military purposes but also for scientific research. Examples from Camp Century were utilized to make stable isotope examinations used to create atmosphere models. Investigations of soil contained in cases proposes that the site was sands ice as late as 400,000 years prior, demonstrating a much decreased Greenland ice sheet and along these lines, a lot of higher ocean levels. In June 1959, the development Camp Century started and was finished by October 1960, just over a year and four months, which makes it quite astonishing considering the complexity of such a project. Armed Force designs initially needed to fabricate a three-mile street to bring the 6,000 tons of provisions it would require to assemble the $8 million offices. The majority of substantial gear, including vehicles, were brought by sledges known as overwhelming swings, which literally ran at a snail's pace of two miles per hour, making it a 70-hour trip from the Thule airbase. Armed force builds initially utilized Swiss-made Peter plows to delve profound channels in the day office. The channels were secured with a top of steel curves and finished off with more day off. Inside the channels, engineers set up pre-assembled wooden structures, leaving air gaps on each side to limit liquefying. The biggest chain, known as Central Avenue, was more than a thousand feet in length. The designers bored an opening into the ice, developing a well which gave 10,000 day-by-day gallons of new fresh drinking water. Protected was a warm funneling tube that was introduced for water and power while a progression of brake hatches was likely worked if there should be an occurrence of a crisis. At long last, Camp Century comprised of 26 passages, nearly two miles altogether. It included quarters, a kitchen, cafeteria, a med clinic, clothing, and an interchanges community, a diversion lobby, a sanctuary, and even a barber shop. The last bit of Camp Century was the portion of the PM-2, a versatile medium-force atomic reactor, the first of its kind. The shipment alone comprised of 400 tons of hardware. Everything must be taken care of with extraordinary consideration. In the freezing states of Greenland, metal turned out to be weak and could break for any reason. The camp itself was not a mystery. Formerly, it was worked for legitimate purposes under the sponsorship of the Army Polar Research and Development Center. The Army even created a short film advancing Camp Century as a distant examination network. 
The office saw some huge logical revelations. For example, some of the first investigations of ice centers, uncovering topographical insider facts going back 100,000 years. Science, though, was not the primary role of Camp Century. The office was manufactured principally as a test for a military activity, including atomic rockets. Project Ice Worm was the code given to establish a nuclear missile network around the North Atlantic. In the beginning phases of Project Ice Worm, getting Danish authorization to send rockets in Greenland gave off an impression of being a likely barricade. The 1951 understanding permitted the development of army installations that said nothing regarding atomic missiles. Undertaking Project Ice Worm was a highly confidential U.S. states army program of the Cold War, which was intended to fabricate a system of portable atomic rocket dispatch destinations under the Greenland Ice Sheet a definitive goal of putting medium-extend rockets under the ice, sufficiently close to a striking focus inside the Soviet Union, was left well enough alone by the government of Denmark. The army promoted Ice Worm as an optional contrast to the Minutemen ICBMs situated in the mainland United States. Authorities referred to the one-of-a-kind versatility of the ice caps to an atomic arrangement, including its distance area and closeness to the Soviet Union. Iceman rockets positioned at mystery areas all throughout Greenland would be hard to target, guaranteeing the United States' second strike abilities. The Preparation Studies Division of the U.S. Armed Forces Engineer Studies Center delivered its first investigation of ice worm in 1960, strategic value of the Greenland ice cap, in which it closed. The rocket power is covered up and slippery. It's sent into an extensive cut-and-cover burrow arranged in which men and rockets are shielded from the climate and, to a certain extent, from foe assault. The arrangement is safe to everything except gigantic assaults and still, after all, a majority of power can be propelled. Camouflage and inconstancy of arrangement design are misused to keep the foe from focusing on essential components of energy. During the mid-60s, American authorities additionally considered Ice Worm as an approach to share atomic weapons under the support of NATO. At that point, some NATO individuals, especially France, needed to be remembered for the U.S.-British nuclear sharing system, a questionable solicitation for the United States given its long-term strategy of retaining privileged atomic insights. Ice Worm introduced a potential answer for this issue since it would concrete the key segment of NATO collusion. The other American proposition for this issue was the formation of a multilateral force, a NATO alliance of boats and submarines that would be outfitted with U.S. Naval Forces Polaris rockets. The Navy's multilateral force venture was one of the motivations behind why the Army was so keen on Ice Worm. Army authorities would not like to be abandoned by the opposition for government financing. The United States eventually picked the multilateral force as its official proposition for NATO atomic sharing. This choice was one of the encouraging components that prompted the scratch-off of Ice Worm. At long last, in any case, the force did not work out as intended either, as the French government immediately dismissed it. Hey, if you liked the video so far, remember to like and subscribe. Now back to it. Although bureaucratic troubles positively contributed, worry over Project Ice Worm's specialized possibility was the essential factor of its destruction. For instance, Army authorities raised worries over the adjustments of the Minutemen required to assemble the Iceman rocket, which would need more to work in incredibly cold conditions. It's also hard to find and speak with missiles under the Arctic ice. In conclusion and all above, it was turning out to be progressively evident that the Greenland ice sheet was just too shaky to even think about supporting the venture. The army only couldn't hazard conveying many rockets and burrows, which could fall at any second. Thus, Project Ice Worm was authoritatively dropped in 1963. Politically, the overall presence of Camp Century was comprehended by both the Danish and U.S. governments, which together marked the 1951 Defense of Greenland arrangement under the protection of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The Army Corps engineer reports recognize the nearness of Danish contacts engaged with the arranging and ecological checking of Camp Century. These reports, for instance, recommend Danish authorization for the operational removal of 1.2 times 10 to the power of 9 of radiological waste in the ice sheet. 
It is scrambled whether Denmark was adequately counseled in regards to the particular decommissioning of Camp Century, and this manner whether the relinquished squanders there remain U.S. property. Article 6 of the 1951 arrangement expressed that all property gave by the government of the United States of America and situated in Greenland will remain the property of the government of the United States of America. It might be expelled from Greenland, liberated from any limitation, or discarded in Greenland by the government of the United States of America after counsel with Danish specialists. Given the global starting point and a multi-generational heritage of Camp Century, there seems, by all accounts, to be considerable vagueness encompassing the political and legitimate risk related with moderating the likely remobilization of its poisons. Interests likely vary across NATO individuals, especially Denmark and the US. What's more, Canada incompletely on account of the particular degrees of chronicle cooperation in the future of potential contamination introduction. Our examination features that Camp Century currently has an unexpected political importance considering an anthropogenic environmental change. The likely mobilization of squanders that were recently viewed as appropriately sequestered or safeguarded forever is an occasion, conceivably the first, of a possible new pathway to a political debate related to environmental change. A few such channels have just been recognized, including disagreements about emanation decreases, changing farming examples, constrained movement, and recently open Arctic assets. While we have concentrated on cryospheric change in the Arctic, the impacts of environmental change are multifaceted and far-reaching. Ocean level ascent, for instance, is presently ready to remobilize dangerous squander at low-lying decommissioned locales, regular citizen and military the same. Environmental change is in the way prone to enhance political debates related to deserted wastes in an assortment of settings. In this specific circumstance, the moving destiny of relinquished ice sheet army installations under environmental change may give a microcosm through which to inspect the worldwide and multi-generational challenges introduced by ecological change. In the new investigation, a team of scientists took stock of the losses at Camp Century and ran atmosphere model reenactments to decide if the waste will wait in the warming Arctic. The group examined chronicled U.S. Armed Force building records to figure out where and how profound the squanders were covered and how much the ice top had moved since the 50s. McFerrin investigated ground-entering radar from NASA's Operation Icebridge airplane to pinpoint the camp's immediate area and profundity. He said, quote, The radar shows smooth layers of the day office until arriving at the camp. At that point, the signs get untidy. We don't yet have enough detail to plan precisely what everything is down there. However, the diagram is clear. The team found the loss at Camp Century covers 50 hectares, 136 sections of land. Generally, the size of 100 football fields. They gauge the site contains 200,000 liters or 53,000 gallons of diesel fuel, enough for a vehicle to circle the globe multiple times. Because of building materials utilized in the Arctic at that point, the creators theorize the site contains polychlorinated biphenyls, toxins poisonous to human well-being. They additionally gauge the site has 240,000 thousand liters or 63 gallons of wastewater, including sewage, alongside an obscure volume of low-level radioactive coolant from the atomic generator. Taking a gander at existing, the same old thing, atmospheric projections, the group decided the squanders would not stay encased in ice always, as was expected by both the U.S. Denmark when the camp was relinquished. Instead, they could dissolve and reappear in the earth. At the point when we took a gander at the atmospheric reenactments, they recommended that, as opposed to never-ending snowfall, it appears as right on time as 2090, the site could change from clear snow to net dissolve. Camp Century's waste presents a critical natural risk, as per the investigation's creators. At the point when the ice dissolves, poisons could be moved into the sea, where they could upset marine biological systems, the scientists said. Because of ice sheet perceptions close to Camp Century, however, at lower heights, the camp's waste could be uncovered sooner than the examination models foresee, said Jennifer Mercer, a cryospheric researcher with the National Science Foundation, who has some expertise and procedure on the Greenland ice sheet, but was not associated with the investigation. 
The investigation does not advocate for beginning site remediation exercises at Camp Century now. The waste is covered several meters beneath the ice, and any cleanup exercises would be expensive and, in fact, testing. This indeed turns into a circumstance of holding up until the ice sheet is softened down to nearly uncover the squanders that anybody should advocate for site remediation. In any case, the new investigation brings up issues about who is liable for tidying up the waste when it is uncovered. Global law is clear about duty regarding forestalling future unsafe wastes, however equivocal about who is obligated for squandering previously disposed of, says Jessica Green, a political researcher representing considerable authority in worldwide ecological law at New York University, who also was not associated with the investigation. Albeit Camp Century was a U.S. base, it is on Danish soil, and even though Greenland is a Danish region, it is self-overseeing, she said. The implications of environmental change on politically vague relinquished wastes has not been considered previously, as indicated by the examination's creators. That's it for today. If you liked the video, remember like, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. Y'all have a good one.